here's what a lot of people get stuck with that mm-hmm. I've seen. You know, they'll spend their first couple of weeks on just figuring out a business name and mm-hmm. a logo. Yep. Logos and figure out business cards. And they're like, well, I can't do anything else until I get this perfect. Mm-hmm. And you're absolutely wrong about that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Those are the back burner items. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just, they're things that you think are important, but they're, they're not that important. You're checking out the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge and Jeremy Kitchen. They're on the path to financial freedom and they're taking their community with them. Stay tuned for the best free real estate investing advice on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Investor Shed Podcast. My name is Jeremy Kitchen, one of the hosts of the Investor Shed, here with my lovely co-host, Nicholas Beveridge. Nick, how are you doing today? So much better now that you just called me lovely. You're Appreciate lovely that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You're a lovely man too. We got a special episode for you today. Actually, we're just going to cut right into the intro and talk all about business and setting up businesses today. So, um, Hell yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is for the beginners out there, or maybe you're already seasoned and you just want some extra advice on your service-based business. So mm-hmm. we're going to get into what it takes to start up and run a service-based business, yeah. aren't we? It'll be a good time, I think. So. If, if I don't stumble over every word. We can stumble over as many words as we <laughs> want, man. Thank you all for listening, by the way. If you find what we do useful, please go on to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave us a five-star review. Uh, it really helps people see the program, see the show, and bring more listeners to the program like yourself. So thank you again. Heck yeah. All right, let's get into it. So a brief background on us. Jeremy, why don't you get started with telling everybody about your business? Sure. And then we'll dive in deeper a little bit later. Sure, sure. So I got a couple businesses I'm running right now. Obviously, I'm running my hard money brokering business. If you need hard money in the Idaho area or Spokane, Washington area or anywhere in the nation, please let me know. I'd love to be a part of your deal. But the one we're going to be talking about today is Ginger Snap Media. Brief rundown of this, I think we've talked about it in previous episodes, but Nick and I actually started Ginger Snap Media in 2019. Nick owned the business at the time, and I was mainly working for his team doing, you know, various tasks. I was editing the podcast, doing this. Recently, I took up over the business, and I've been uh, trying to grow it as well as I can by myself, and there's a key by that, right? So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Perfect. Yeah. All right. And with me, mostly what I do is I run a real estate sales business. So I'm a realtor and I have a team of real estate agents and an admin team that help me help clients buy and sell real estate. Now, of course, I've done other businesses. I have a rental portfolio. I've done fix and flips. Like Jeremy said, I started the media company with Jeremy as an employee, but I started it. And I've done numerous other ventures that I didn't really stick with, but The reason uh, I'm going to just focus today on our real estate sales business, because that's the one that I feel like I have the most authority about talking confidence about, because I've been able to run it (laughs) for 13 years now and refine it over time. There's many things that I wish I would have done differently when I started. So that's why we're going to be doing this episode. Yeah. And I think that's really good. Obviously, if you start a business and you find yourself like spinning your gears or not making traction at all, that doesn't mean the business is a failure. It just might mean you have to shift a couple things. And they don't even have to be major things. They can just be small little tweaks. But everyone knows, obviously, small tweaks over time compound. And they make a really well-oiled machine. That's what we're hopefully going to try to convey today, that we have well-oiled machines that uh, work pretty well. Well-oiled machines. That's right. Because if you don't put oil in them, the engines die. And you can make a metaphor for pretty much anything, but it's funny how they all relate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So Jeremy, why don't we talk, give us a little personal story about what it's been like Mm -hmm. starting your business again. I guess you have an interesting one because you kind of had a little bit of a head start Uh and then we let this business die and then you decided to pick it it up and run with it. What made you want to pick up Ginger Snap? Good question. And run. Yeah. So what made me want to pick it up and run with it is um, even after we were like done with it, we let it die, we burned it to the ground. (laughs) I was still having people like, what would it take? To get you to come back out and do photos for me. Yes. And I just realized that like, there's still a need for this. There's still a need for professional video and photography for real estate or entrepreneurs. So, so what you had was one of the big key ingredients of any business. One of the big three is leads. Great. I um, leads. <laughs> and we'll talk about the other two later, but mm. leads, even when we killed this business, the leads <clears throat> kept coming in. Yep. I mean, I, I said I said no to a lot of people because I was really trying to be intentional at that time. I'm like, nope, I'm doing my hard money brokering. I'm sorry, I can't take it on. But the more opportunity that just kept coming my way, I felt like I was just leaving money on the table. Yeah. With a skill set that I know how to do well. 
Right. So, but at the time mm-hmm. when we were running it together, it just wasn't that efficient. Right. Yeah, it really wasn't that efficient. And we, we can talk about it now, obviously, because I think like when we first ran it, and this is nothing that either of us did wrong. It was just kind of how we envisioned it. Yeah. I was doing a lot of stuff for your guys' team as an employee of you at cost. And when you do things at cost, it's hard to make profit. <laughs> right. That's true. That is true. Right? Yeah. We didn't really focus on charging an appropriate amount of money right. for the business. We were just trying to get people in the door. Right. And, you know, when you when you undercut yourself and you undercut your time, people will only use you because you're cheap. And that is an effective method to get in the business. Sure. But that's not exactly like a way to grow proportionately, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Well, I guess we didn't have a whole lot of vision Mm -hmm. when we started. The only vision was, hey, let's start a media company because I think it's important. I think it could pay for itself. And it goes hand in hand with the real estate sales business. And we can just have more control over the media. Right. We can do podcasts. You can go out and do get real estate agent business Mm -hmm. from agents and shoot and record their listings. Right. So if people are confused on what exactly you do, <laughs> right, right, right. You, you work with a lot of real estate agents. A lot of real estate agents. Uh, now lately, a lot of entrepreneurs and real estate investors like yourselves actually just putting out content and trying to be ahead of the game and do what everyone else is doing, which, you know, typically you don't want to do, but there is a strategy for putting yourself on social media and putting out high quality content as well. Yeah. So the, one of the biggest reasons why this business did eventually die mm-hmm. with or out was because the vision wasn't really, hey, we're going to make this a sustainable business long term that's profitable. Sure. It was, hey, we're going to kind of figure it out. Hopefully it pays for itself. But we'd really just like to utilize mm-hmm. what the business offers, its services to suit our other business needs. Right. So when that broke away, when there was no longer a requirement to have an employee run business that served another business's marketing mm-hmm. needs... That business kind of withered away, but there's still a big demand 100%, for it. 100%, yes. You kept getting calls. Mm-hmm. What was one of the biggest reasons that you decided to just go all in? I decided to go all in because like, I've been doing this for three years at that time. And I realized like, I'm really good at this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I felt honestly like, I'm like, I feel like I'm letting a huge opportunity pass me by with something I'm good at, something I can be helpful with others. And I love doing that. And something I can just provide value with, right? So when we're out on real estate shoots, I can kind of direct you a little bit for how you should be talking or what you should be saying. If you slip up in your words, you know, maybe I'm the one who's like, eh, let's redo that again. Right. So yeah, I think I provide a lot of value in the business. And again, I I realized that like there is money to be made here once I can structure and price things accordingly. True that. Yep. And I mean, just for example, like, I mean, we'd go up like with your team, we would go up to say like Bonner's Ferry. We live in Coeur d'Alene. So that's hour and a half, two hours away. Right. Yeah, we'd be doing this stuff at cost. And if I was making, you know, 25 bucks an hour, and I'm up there all day, like that's a $100 day for me. Yeah, right. Versus like now I can go get two clients in a day and make 1300 bucks. Yeah, huge difference. Huge that's difference. 10x your income, right? <laughs> Obviously, I've got business taxes and, and you know, expenses on top of that. But the potential is there, I can schedule myself accordingly, if I don't want to work one day. And if I want to come do podcasts, I can just do that. Yeah. So you're in complete control of your own schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do it all. Yep. Basically. (laughs) You're the admin, the scheduler and the runner arounder and the content creator. I will say it's a lot. Like I am right now, I'm the visionary and the integrator of the company. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's uh, it's more than I thought I'd bargain for, but everything I thought it would be. (laughs) Right. But, but what are some of the pros other than just the money? I mean, the money's good. Like I said, I think it's the scheduling and the freedom of time is what's nice, right? So yeah. if you and I even have an investment project where we're you know, running behind or con- contractors don't show up, like if I don't have any shoots on, I can just go work at that project. True. And okay. that's a big plus, right? Like I have full flexibility of when I can schedule and when I don't have to schedule. If I want to put the pedal to the metal, I can do that. If I want to take a five-day vacation, I can do that. Nice. Yeah. So the freedom of time, I mean, like, yes, I am spending a lot of time in the business, but I actually have a better freedom of time when I, I need it. Yeah. So if you don't mind me prying a little bit. Let's do it. So basically, you took over the business that mm-hmm. we kind of had that was laying there mm-hmm. on the floor, but there was already equipment. Yep. We worked out a deal 
which you can hear on another episode, the, mm-hmm. the details of that. But briefly, to explain it, we just... I wanted to trade instead of money. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you want to take this business and run with it, take all the equipment, mm-hmm. which there's a, a lot of equipment with this. Yep. Take the name, take Gingersat Media LLC. Mm-hmm. You know, we can just transfer that into your name, become the owner. Mm-hmm. But what I want in return is uh, 12 videos that I can use over the next 12 months yep. for my business that you can you can take time to maybe produce over you know a couple days. A sure. month or something like that. Yeah. But then you didn't need to, you know, put a credit card down to s- purchase your own equipment. Now I know you still had to make continual investments, so oh, it's sure. not like you got into it completely scot free. Right. But making that decision to do that—that mm-hmm. that was only uh, what nine months ago or something like that. Yeah, it was in March of 2023, and I think it's what November now. So yeah, right around eight nine months ago. Yeah. What were you making as an employee, if you remember, on mm-hmm. an average month? On an average month, I think my take home was roughly, let's see, I think it was close to two thousand bucks a month after insurance, after everything like that. So okay, and after you know your taxes get taken out. So gotcha. Yeah, and if you're really working hard, how much money can you make in a week? That's a good question. I think my average month has been around ninety five hundred bucks. Wow. Okay. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, your average month, and now you're less than a year in, and your average month now mm-hmm. from picking up a dead business is close to ten grand. You know, you're making six figures a year, basically. Pretty dang close. Yes. Yeah. And, and obviously, like being, I'm self employed now, so I'm set up as what and I'm sure we'll go into this too. But I'm set up as a C corp, not an S corp, so I have pretty heavy self business tax. You can listen to Tom Robinson's episode right before this. He kind of goes all in. Yeah, that. last week's episode right. is awesome. Last week's episode was very good. But yeah, self business tax. So I'm getting taxed at like a 15% tax rate just for self business tax along with like 33% for FICA. Yeah. And other taxes. <laughs> so. But we heard some, you know, great tips mm-hmm. right away how you can minimize your tax liability by becoming an employee of your own company. That way you can eliminate that uh, self employment tax, mm-hmm. you know, number, but because you can exclude yourself being an owner, right. an employee, just pay yourself a, a decent wage. Right, right. And then, you know, owning real estate and mm-hmm. you're doing that. So you can definitely minimize your tax liability oh, 100%. Yeah, by yeah. continuing to make the two businesses a hand in hand, you know, your real estate investment business mm-hmm. and your media business. Yep. But that's for another episode, another topic. We'll do a part two of the tax episode, Tom which was, was awesome. Great, by the way. So yeah, thanks again for Tom for joining us for sure. But yeah, that's kind of the background on Ginger Snap. I mean, like I said, right now, like the, the thing I like about it is I'm com- in complete control of where it goes. If I want to put my foot on the gas, let's go. If I want to take a few days break, which I'm going to be taking some breaks in January, my wife's having a baby, so uh, I will be taking a little bit of time off, and that's just okay. I've got the money saved up on my business bank account and ready to roll. Yeah, you don't need to ask yourself for time off. Right. <laughs> and if I just, you know, if, if funds get tight, I can just go work some more. That's true. Yep. What about you, though? So kind of give us some background on um, NERT, if you don't mind. NERT, okay, so NERT stands for North Idaho REI Team. Mm -hmm. The background is it's a real estate sales team, and I kind of had this envision for a very long time. Not when I first got into real estate as an agent. When I first got, was thinking about getting my license, I thought it would just help me understand real estate a little bit better because I wanted to be an investor. I bought my very first house in 2008. Mm -hmm. And just didn't know much about real estate. And I was very young and kind of stupid and made some mistakes, bought the wrong type of house in the wrong location with the wrong type of financing, mm-hmm. not analyzing what rents would be, not making the right type of repairs. Yep. I just made mistake after mistake after mm-hmm. mistake. But at that time in my life, I was going through a lot of real estate seminars. I was listening to a lot of Robert Kiyosaki content, mm-hmm. all his books. I would listen to him on audio. I was learning how to read at the time, too, because I was kind of an idiot young adult and (laughs) really didn't know how to read well. Right. But, you know, read his book and a few others and actually taught myself how to read. Yeah. So it was a lot of growing at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, if I was in the business of real estate, I might learn a little bit more about it if that was like my full time job. Sure. And I knew, you know, my dad was a real estate agent. Maybe he knew some things I asked him about. Short sales at the time was huge. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I know all about short sales. If you ever have a question, just just ask. I remember him saying that. And that kind of sparked me wanting to just get my license because, hey, he knows all about short sales. 
I just took like a $5,000 course to yeah. learn about short sales. <laughs> and then when I left the course, I didn't know, I don't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. And that goes into like utilizing the resources that are available too, right? Like your dad knew all about short sales. That's just a resource that you could kind of cling on to and, and learn from and further yep. your knowledge in the industry. I want to cut back just a second and say, when you made mistakes when you were younger, I hope you're not ashamed of those, right? Because like, yep. and, and anyone listening or watching, like mistakes are part of the game. Oh, I'm ashamed of one thing, several things, but <laughs> right, right, one right. thing in particular, I, I built this shower of this house at, at this Kellogg house mm -hmm. in this downstairs laundry room that had a toilet and a sink. And I was so upset that my house only had a bathtub and I couldn't really fit a shower uh -huh. in it because the ceilings were kind of really short and curved weird. Okay. Trusses had a really high pitch. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a shower in the downstairs bathroom and I figured that it would rent easier if I did something like that. And so I remember spending like a whole month of income hiring this guy that was a plumber at one point mm -hmm. to install this <laughs> shower. And I actually boxed in the washer and dryer without even thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if at any point, whenever the washer or dryer went out, they're just stuck and you'd have to like break them apart to get them out. So I made some oversights. <laughs> sure. And but and, I guess what I wanted to say on that, like, yes, you made oversights. And I think every person getting into the bins is going to like, no yeah. matter what business you're starting, like, in, unless you have like a, a business degree and even then like people mess up, but you know, when you're starting out as an entrepreneur or a business owner, mistakes are just part of the game. Yeah. And it's okay. The best thing you can do is honestly learn from them like you did, right? Yeah. You, everything you learned or everything you did, you learned not to do again. Right. And and that's better than any course I will wager that exists. Yeah. So anyway, I boxed in the, the washer dryer and I moved to Florida. <laughs> okay. And uh, when I moved to Florida is when I saw a real estate sign on the side of the highway at this real estate office that mm -hmm. said real estate agent sales classes, 150 bucks. Okay. And I'm like, man, I've got a $200. I can afford to become a, a an agent. Yeah. This is it. This is a sign. And I need to, I need to go do this. And what I thought was I would just use it as an opportunity to learn more and then become an entrepreneur mm -hmm. just by having the license. Cause I thought the license would teach me stuff. Sure. Not true, obviously. <laughs> and there's a lot that happened in between that and getting my license, but I'll skip that part. When I finally got my license, I started with Keller Williams Realty mm -hmm. and there was nobody in the office ever because we had just went through a massive recession in Florida mm -hmm. and all the agents that were left that didn't leave the business completely went to another brokerage sure. and there were like 10 people left at this office and hardly anyone ever showed up. So I would come into an empty office and I had this KW intranet that had online training. Mm -hmm. And I remember that Gary Keller was, had plenty of content, you know, before YouTube was big, sure. maybe it was big at the time, but not really for this kind of niche real estate education. And he started talking about growing a real estate team and that you can actually grow a business and not just be a self-employed person trying to do it all. Mm -hmm. And I just had this, this huge insight just rushed through me like, oh my gosh, I don't have to just use this as an opportunity to learn about real estate. I can actually grow a business out of it because Robert, Kiyos Robert Kiyosaki kept telling me that self-employed people are idiots. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, because you try to do it all and then you're just going to work yourself to death and pay the highest taxes. Mm -hmm. Learning. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know that in real estate, you can grow a team mm -hmm. of people to do, you know, over time, you can put a business together that runs itself and you can go do your other things in life. You sure. don't have to be a slave to the phone forever right. or to your clients. Mm -hmm. It was a new interesting concept. So right from the beginning, when I started taking my notes with clients in my database, I started talking in the third person as if somebody someday would, uh, somebody on my team would be reading it, the notes of my clients that, oh, Nick went and did this. Instead of no notes or right. I went and showed this house. You know, I, I always wanted to think right from the beginning that I had this vision. Someday I would have a team and they'll be reading my notes someday. So I acted as such mm -hmm. when I made all my notes in my database about my clients Sure, and learned a lot since then. But that's, that's one interesting story about how I kind of got started in it. Sure. And then obviously just before you got to your real estate team, like, I mean, you went through a couple of iterations of what your team was. When you were in Florida, obviously you were a single agent on a Keller Williams brokerage. Yes. Yep. yep. It was just me. Yep. And then when you came up here, I remember you did a CDA sold guy for a while. 
Yep. That was just you as well, correct? Yeah, actually. So when I moved up here, I actually joined somebody else's team. That's right. Okay. So I got to experience what it was like working in somebody else's real estate business Mm -hmm. of somebody that was growing what I wanted to grow. Right. And I thought it would be a great opportunity. He just randomly invited me to kind of join the team one day. Yeah. I really had to think about it because I'm like, well, this isn't going to be a long-term thing. Right. But holy crap, I can actually learn from the inside, right. like get kind of insider's info on how this structure works right. and who he hires and what these people do. I can learn from the inside. Right. So for a year, I worked on the team and I was actually pretty horrible. I wasn't that great at my job because I just didn't have the same motivation. I was growing somebody else's business. Right. And I learned pretty quickly in real estate, it's like six months. <laughs> I learned over six months or so that, man, I, this just isn't going to work out. I just, I cannot get up in the morning with the same kind of energy right. and the same kind of drive to build something if I'm building somebody else's thing. But going to that point though, too, like you joined a team because you wanted to learn how a team was ran. Right. Right. Yep. So like, again, the knowledge that you learned in that six months to a year working on that team. Yeah, it's it about a year. It's about a year, right? And then that that gave you the framework and the guidelines of how to start. Obviously, you've made tweaks along the way to your yeah. own business, but but that gave you kind of a starting block, right? True. So if anybody is looking for starting blocks, like don't be afraid to go work for somebody who does what you do or what does what you want to do. Yeah, I don't regret it at all. Mm-hmm. It was the best learning experience ever. Right. And, uh, you know, it was, it was great. Yeah. Um, got to learn on somebody's team of doing something that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And I got to take a lot of mental notes yep. throughout that year about how I would do things differently mm-hmm. or what I would do the exact same. Right. And uh, I think it was a pretty fair trade. You know, I split half my income with that team mm-hmm. to do what they say to do. And I got to make a little bit of income. And then when I left, there was no hard feelings. Right. And I went and eventually started my own thing. It took about another year sure. for me to find the right lead generation systems that were sustainable for me and to find the right partner to grow it. Sure. And like you said, like you being on that team, like your motivation was down because you didn't want to be an employee. You didn't want to be some a part of somebody's system. You wanted to create the system. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's where like Ginger Snap kind of came in too. Like when at the beginning, you know, we were kind of just going with what you said and kind of how that was structured right Uh now that i own it like there's nothing wrong with that like i learned how i didn't want to run it right and that's okay (laughs) there's nothing bad about that i just like oh i can actually like you can have full decision if this is necessary or not because you're doing the day-to-day things right exactly that maybe i didn't see right and i I think there's probably there's a lot of behind the scene things that like you can't really explain or, you know, like when you ask me like, how come profits down? And I have to be like, well, how many shoots did I do for you guys? <laughs> how much, uh, how many podcasts did I edit for you? Like that's, that's money taking away from money in our pocket, True. but it's also money that's not making you have to pay for other things. So, yeah. And again, we've talked about that on previous episodes too. So it's, yeah. Well, from your point of view, mm-hmm. like you worked for Ginger Sand for two years mm-hmm. and we kind of built that company from nothing. Mm-hmm. And we were just kind of copycatting other people. Mm-hmm of how they ran their media business. But was there anything that you were kind of forced to do other than the side projects? But is there anything that in that business that we were doing that you eventually found to be very inefficient or something that we were totally not doing that we should have been doing? Uh, Good question. I I don't know if it was just like a one-to-one translation of like didn't do, should do. But I just, you know, you learn like, ah, this stuff isn't really effective over here. I don't really know any examples right now, unfortunately. But yeah, there there were things I was just like, You know, maybe we should charge more for my services. Yeah. Again, because I didn't want to be the cheapest in the land, and I still don't want to be the cheapest. I want to be pretty damn middle of the road, if I can say so myself. (laughs) Um, There's better photographers. There's cheaper photographers. People work with me because they like working with me. Yes. Um, Because I'm that person who brings them value to their business. And I've even talked to realtors, like, like, your photos don't even need to be perfect. Like, I don't care. They just need to be good. Okay, if anybody's taking notes out there, which I'm, I hope one person is, but you got to write down what Jeremy just said. People do business mm-hmm. with who they know, like, and trust 100%. in the service business. Yep. So that's something that Jeremy recognized. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the biggest things that you got to try to focus on when you're running a service-based business mm-hmm. is how can I get people to know me, mm-hmm. like me, and trust me? Right. And if you have those big three things... Your life is going to be so much easier with your conversion rates. 100%. Yeah. And that's where, you know, social media comes in too, but that's an ep- that's a topic for another day. But speaking of service-based businesses, I do want to kind of go what the difference is between that and um, yeah. product-based businesses. Perfect. So, 
Okay, so what Jeremy and I know is service-based businesses. Mm -hmm. We do not know, and that's why we're not going to give any advice <laughs> on, is the other like retail type of businesses where you're selling tangible products, right. manufacturing, you know, if you have a storefront, yep. selling products, storage, storage, buying facilities where mm -hmm. you have to kind of hold inventory. Jeremy sells a digital product. Yep. And his service is going out physically with his body to go create that product. Right. We have inventory, but the inventory is shared amongst agents and we buy into it. So again, I'm selling a service of being able to convince people to when it's time to buy or sell a house, choose us as your agents, mm -hmm. because we're going to help walk you through this better than most people we know or the best we can. Right. So, but we don't actually have, even though we are selling houses, we're not necessarily manufacturing those homes and keeping them in storage. Right, right. And uh, <laughs> so there's different types of businesses out there. We're talking about service-based businesses. This is kind of what we know. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole other monster out there that we have no idea about. Right. And yeah. I guess this would be a good time to say, like, all of these opinions are for entertainment only, right? This is not legal advice on any of it, but this is just stuff yeah. we've learned along the way. Yeah, we're uh, just sharing what we know. So you can't sue me <laughs> if you start a business and it sucks. I, you can try. You can try, but right, yeah. why would you do that? That'd be a dick move. Um, um, there are dicks out there that suit people. It's true. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> Ask of service-based businesses. Though, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we don't know anything about really retail businesses. We definitely were service-based, right? And what, like what Nick said too. Yes, he's selling houses, but he's not actually like the owner of the land, holding the land, doing the thing with it. He's more or less a broker and, and a servicer of your services. You get people to find the product that you sell. Yep. And you get people interested in, you hold the open houses and you do these things. It's not actually a, a tangible product. Right. What's cool about what we offer, though, is that, you know, we have the flexibility and the scalability. Mm -hmm. you know, we can scale businesses, even though we're not selling products. If you wanted, you can hire maybe digital or VAs mm -hmm. to edit your photos. You can hire someone to go shoot photos for you. Yep. You just train them. You can take this as deep as you want to go. You can go to multiple different locations throughout the country. Yep. And just, you know, once you get your systems dialed in, you can just start like a printing press. Just print it. Okay, in this market, we're going to do on into Spokane next. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start training people in Spokane. Yeah. We're going to go here next. Because there are people out there that will gladly work in your business. Sure. And right now you're doing it all. You're working on the business and in the business, 100%, right? 100%, yes. And to your point there, it is it is a lot, but like... I but it's it. manageable. It is manageable, yes. And yeah. I, I make that manageable by managing my own schedule. Again, like I can choose when and where I go, and that's just the best part of this thing because if I need a lot of money, I can I can create an ad. Uh huh. And I can just go out and get it. And that's like and I think people's motivation is is tied to how much money they want to make, right? But this is definitely like I have X amount of time in a day and I can I can do X amount of things. I could absolutely scale it. It is on my list. I have a couple of ideas to expand in the future, but right now I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Yeah. So, so that's where I'm at. And you're refining your skills, right. like you're sharpening your ax, mm -hmm. like you're seeing what works, what doesn't, and you know, what areas you prefer to go into, whatnot. I'm mm -hmm. sure. And you're creating different types of content. And then, and it seems like it's, the trends are changing constantly. I yeah. don't know. And you seem to be up to date on a lot of it. I'm kind of old school when you it are. comes to technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I prefer to meet people in person, blah, blah, right, blah, right, blah. Right. I, and, but, and not that I don't, like I still have a lot of meetings in person, like, and these meetings, which is cool with, about my business, because I'm, I'm working directly with mostly realtors, getting in front of realtors. And then when, you know, we're at the house shooting, I talk to them about my hard money business too. Yeah. Hey, by the way, like, are you guys, are you looking to do invest? Do you do any of this stuff? By the way, I'm a hard money broker. You know, take my card. If you ever need anything, let's, let's chat. Let's have a coffee about it. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like a free lead generation for my other business too. <laughs> yeah. Well, hold on real, real quick though. You, you just brought up another good point. Mm -hmm. You work mostly with real estate agents. Mm -hmm. And then now you're opening it up to other entrepreneurs as well. But yep. when you first started your real estate photography business, which we didn't talk about in this episode, but we do in another mm -hmm. episode two, I think, of season three. Yeah, I think so. I think we talk more about when you started your real estate photography business back when you were in your younger 20s. Oh, yeah. You were trying to do it all, like weddings, family photos, whatever mm -hmm. business kind of comes your way. Right now, you niche, and mm -hmm. you, the it's cliche, but yep. the, the riches are in the niches. 100%. Um, because... When it comes to real estate photography, how many options are there? 
I, I mean, there are plenty, actually, I will say. I mean, in, the in area, relation to how many agents are there? Good question. Yeah. Is there like 2,000 agents? Yeah. I think there's probably in the Coeur d'Alene area, maybe 10 real estate photographers. Okay. Maybe. And I, I don't maybe. know. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, I know people that are regularly doing it right. full time. Mm -hmm. How many of those are there? Probably three to four. And you have 2,000 agents mm -hmm. in this market. So when the, when it comes time to, you know, okay, who's the go-to real estate photographer people? Mm -hmm. There's only a few. There's only a few, right. Yeah. Uh, and it, again, what Nick said earlier, it's all about who you know, like, and trust. So people know me, they like what I do, and they're happy to, you know, when anyone needs a recommendation online, I get so many recommendations just from the people that I cater to in my business. So another business tip, like you treat your clients well. And they'll they'll expand your business for you, yeah, right, yeah. And I'd like to throw this out there too, when we, because we're talking about the media business and mm -hmm. photography. If we just had to guess, I mean, how many photographers would you say there are in this area? Five hundred. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> and these are people that you know. Oh, I'll do wedding. I'll do your weddings. I'll mm -hmm. do your uh, family photos. You know, kind of whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that generalize in when they get into a, a type of business, right? Then you're competing against a lot of people too. Right. Like what really makes my real estate sales business unique because mm -hmm. you know, two thousand agents, right? right? Right. I mean, there's that's a lot of agents for this North Idaho market. It is where it seems like there's only fourteen hundred people living here. <laughs> I mean, there's definitely there's more than that, but right, right. What I niche too. Yeah. I'm known as the guy that you go to for investment properties. Yeah. 100%. Specifically residential real estate investments. Right. And we've grown our whole brand around that. Mm -hmm. And how many competitors do we have? That's a good question. Like people who do exactly what you do. I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, maybe one or two other teams that niche the way you do, mm -hmm. but you guys stand out above the crowd. We do. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't overnight. No, it wasn't. And nothing will but, ever be overnight. <laughs> <laughs> no. But the deeper you niche into something, mm -hmm. the better your odds of conversion can be if somebody's looking for somebody just like you. Right. And we get we leads mm -hmm. weekly. Now, over time, we've refined our uh, lead capture systems. Mm -hmm. Almost weekly, we get organic leads of people that find us from in the area or out of the area, but mm -hmm. they'll find us specifically because, oh, you work with real estate investors. Right. I want to work with you. Yeah. How many, I I know you probably don't know this, but how many people out there go after a particular agent? That's a good question. I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> when they're ready to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Not many. It's usually by default. It's somebody they know or someone that ref they are referred to, but they not type many. In real estate agent on Google, right? They type in real estate agent on Google, but they're really just looking for listings. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a house or something like that. I hate to pat myself on the back too many times, but there's not a whole lot of, buyers out mm -hmm. there that are looking for a particular type of agent sure. and when they do it's very niche mm -hmm. um, so you've got like your ultra luxury you've got commercial mm -hmm. we're a sub category of commercial we're the real estate residential investment right but 90 percent of the real estate agents out there they don't specialize at all they're just like, yeah, if you need me to buy or sell a house real, you know, or land or whatever or business, I, I'll help you out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they wonder why they have such a hard time getting clients. Right. And, and you've cast your net out in, in very specific places, I will say. Yeah. Like you're on Bigger Pockets as one of the registered agents in Idaho, right? So if someone yep. want, types in on Bigger Pockets, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho agent, I think Nick is one of the top ones that pops up for an investor friendly agent in the area. And we don't pay Google anything. Mm -hmm. We don't pay for pay per clicks or anything like that. But if you were to Google North Idaho real estate savvy agent or North Idaho investor savvy, mm -hmm. t type in agent and investor in the same sentence mm -hmm. in Google in North Idaho, we're going to pop up first. Yeah. And we don't pay Google. Yeah. So that's pretty cool that we finally achieved. It took a few years, but yeah. imagine what would happen if you did pay Google. <laughs> well, and that's part of the flaws of my business. I don't know it all. Sure. I don't take advantage or utilize every single marketing technique out there. That's true. I just, uh, I do what I've learned that works the most efficiently for me. Mm -hmm. And I think like if you're going to be running ads or anything, you have to run them consistently. Like you can't just run an ad for a day. You have to run it for a month. Right. Yeah. And it just depends on what message you want to say and what, who you want to cast that net out to. But um, there is definitely power in uh, sponsored ads for sure. Yeah. Well, we've been running the same ad for nine years. Okay. And that ad is if anybody's looking for an investment group mm -hmm. or a 
networking group for real estate investors in the North Idaho area. We've been running that ad for nine years. Do you get any hate mail on your ads? No. That, that, that must be nice. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Should we? I don't know. So I, I ran my first ad for Ginger Snap the other day talking about how I'm looking for five entrepreneurs or real estate agents or investors that want to level up their content game. I've gotten three hate mails in five days. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So we actually don't run cold ads. Okay. We have our networking group listed in multiple different areas that sure. you would go to try to find okay. networking groups. That makes sense. So we're on uh, Meetup, we're on Bigger Pockets, we're on the REI Club website. Yep, REI Networking. Um, we're on, yeah, we're on our old website. Mm-hmm. We're on Craigslist. Uh, we're on sites where people would go to try to find this info. Sure. And we're not necessarily pumping it out and spending dollars. Gotcha. And this is just something that we decided a long time ago. Mm-hmm. We're not going to spend money trying to attract people. Mm-hmm. We're going to make ourselves attractive to people that are looking for someone like us. Sure. Yeah. I think there's power. And easy to, to find. You, so. Easy to find. Right. Easy to find. Easy to work with too. And just, you know, your knowledge and reputation speaks for itself at that point. Because when people Google these things and yep. you pop up, like, it's kind of a no-brainer why people work with you. Yeah. And if we ever had a problem filling the room, mm-hmm. we would definitely run ads. Sure. Uh, we just haven't had a need for it yet. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any case studies or anything you wanted to talk about or? Yeah. Well, when it comes to how to structure your business, maybe. Yeah. Let's see. How, how are we doing? Let's on time? do it. We've got 40 minutes. We're doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's what I did. Mm-hmm. And I don't recommend this to everybody without checking with your tax professional or attorney. Mm-hmm. But I started an LLC. Mm-hmm. And then I started multiple LLCs. But started an LLC with the... Secretary of State. This works for a lot of different states. You, they usually have a website for the Secretary of State that you're in. Mm-hmm. In Idaho, it costs, you can do it all online. You can register a brand new business and you basically download a, a one page form or you can fill it out online. Mm-hmm. And they basically just want the name of your business. And if you're not sure if it's taken or not, you can do a quick search yep. on that website and see if that business is available or not. Mm-hmm. If it's not, don't spend the time and the money to try to get the business name you want. Just doesn't. It almost doesn't matter what it is, right? Because you can always do an um, a, an assumed business name too. Yeah, like a DBA. Yep. Yep. DBA. Mm-hmm. But take some time to actually set it up right the first time and fill out your business name, mm-hmm. and you decide if you're going to be the agent, mm-hmm. the registered agent, which necess- isn't necessarily the owner of the business. That can be that can be your attorney. Yep. It could be LegalZoom. Mm-hmm. It could be another one of your LLCs. It could be yourself. It could mm-hmm. be your wife. It could be an assistant of yours. That registered agent is just somebody who gets the communication from the state. Sure. And then the governors, those are the owners, in my knowledge, that as far as what I know. Sure. Um, so you list out the the owners. You don't have to put, in, in at least in the state of Idaho, you don't have to say what percentage they own or anything like that. And then you just, you know, these principal addresses, what what are the actual mailing or physical addresses for those people that own it? Mm-hmm. What's the mailing physical address for the registered agent? And then you sign it and that's it. And you pay a hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. And then it, it, it could be approved in as quickly as a few minutes or up to a week. Mm-hmm. If you do it online, it could be very quick. It could be, you know, like I said, within a few minutes. Yep. I've seen that if happen you, before. <laughs> when I first started this, I would mail it off. And then you would see it eventually update on the website and they'll mail it back to you. Mm -hmm. That's step one. Step one is to just register an actual entity. And you're basically just like, think of it as you're just creating a a human or (laughs) some sort of an entity that can get a bank account and be the name of something that you do business through and other people can jump into it. Your um, LLC is like, like a living, breathing thing almost, right? Like, so you yep. created a thing. This thing's going to have its own EIN or tax identification number. Yeah, EIN um, is, yep, just yep. like you said, a tax identification number. And what that is, mm-hmm. is like a social security number for your business. Yep. So for humans, you have social security numbers. For businesses, you have EIN numbers. Mm-hmm. And that is to register with the IRS. Right. And you can do that for free on the IRS's website. If you type in Google, you know, start an EIN or get an EIN, Mm -hmm. there's a really big, powerful website out there that makes it look like you're going to the right steps and it charges you 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Don't do that one. (laughs) Also on this note, once you set up a new LLC, 
with, within a month or so, you're going to get a paper in the mail from this Florida company mm-hmm. where they want to charge you 85 bucks a year. And it looks like it's an actual fee that you owe. You have to really read through it carefully, but it's just a marketing thing where they want to be, they want to keep you updated on your annual filings. It's so dumb. Sure. But you got to watch out for scams everywhere that are going to start coming your way. Oh, like the IRS <laughs> sends me a notification no matter what saying like, hey, your annual notice is due. Yeah. Uh, and that's and easy. You click to... on it and there's no payment. You just <laughs> click on it. It's like, you're good. You're all done. Yeah, Great. but that's not every state. So Idaho, Idaho, it's a free annual filing. Mm-hmm. And basically just once a year, you have to go into it that you can do it all. I'd recommend just do it all online. Don't try to do it through the mail. And you do it through the Idaho Secretary of State website. And you can file annually just by clicking through the buttons and making sure everything's still updated the mm-hmm. way it is. Click I accept, write your name, click the date, hit submit, and you're done. Right. And do it again a year after that. Right. And you you talked about doing this yourself, which I do find a viable strategy. I've done enough of these where like the next one I set up, I'm just having an attorney do it. Yeah. To be clear, Mm -hmm. I didn't set the first one up myself. Right. I set the first one up with LegalZoom and they gave me all the correct things that I wanted, like an operating agreement and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it kind of helped me understand the process. Soon after that, I figured it was pretty easy. And if I ever made mistakes, you can always amend that. Right. It's really your operating agreement that you want to get correct. And that is something that you should probably visit with an attorney about. Right. And you got to make sure it's registered correctly. Mm-hmm. And like you said, is it registered correctly with the IRS as well? Is it an S Corp mm-hmm. or C Corp? Or sole partnership, sole proprietor. <laughs> There's a yeah. lot of different ways you can set these up. But we're not going to, let's not overcomplicate no, it. No, and I don't want to overcomplicate it. But but I guess the point I do want to make, like, if you have questions and you're not sure how you should set up your business, 100% pay the $700,000 and just go see an attorney who does this. Um, $700,000? No, seven hundred two dollars Okay, that makes sense. Don't pay $700,000 to uh, set up an LLC. I'll do it for 500000 if that's the case. I'll do but, it for four. Three ninety nine, but that's my lowest. And um, <laughs> no, but like seriously, if you have questions on how this stuff is set up, go get a consult with an attorney. Like set up an hour consultation. They'll they'll do your LLC. They'll do your entity. Yep. Uh, and they'll provide you all the avenues of like, okay, do you want this set up as an S corp? What does that look like? C corp. Here's what happens. Sole proprietorship. You know, if you want to JV with somebody using this, how like what what can you do with it? And I think like specifically going back to Tom Robinson's episode, having that buy sell agreement, if you do any sort of partnership LLCs is uh, very big, but that's just my advice. Go see a professional on it because it's pretty cheap. And then that makes sure it gets set up effectively to what you need. Yeah. If you're going to hire employees, Mm -hmm. go see a professional no matter what, but especially if you're going to hire employees, because it may need to be set up differently. Mm -hmm. And just going into that too, like I said, like I set up gender snap as a C corp, Mm -hmm. just because that's what I thought I needed. Yep. Right. If I would have talked to an attorney, like what I really wanted was an S corp. Okay. What I really wanted was the W two myself, so I could show income. Yep. So I could buy another house. Okay. And and I fucked that up. <laughs> but you can Im- but you can change it. Yep, you can, can amend it. it. Exactly. It's not a big deal. At least you got started, and that that's what I really want to encourage everybody mm-hmm. out there. Don't freeze up and not do anything because mm-hmm. you feel like you might do something wrong. Yep. By not doing it, that's the most wrong thing. One hundred percent. Because then you're just exposing yourself to all the liability. Mm-hmm. If you're not set up correctly with your taxes, it could be fixed. Yep. It's no big deal. But just go out there, get the entity, and get started is what I would do. Mm-hmm. That's just me. That way you don't get stuck in analysis paralysis because you can spend the next several years wondering what's going to be best for you. You're not sure because mm-hmm. maybe you're going to be uh, one year I'm going to hire somebody next year. No, I'm just not. And then I need, oh, actually, I need a holding company. Oh, right, I right. do need a trust, though. And then maybe the trust will have this general partnership, and then the general partnership will own the LLCs. Right. So it will get complex do that later. no matter what. So keep it simple from the start and just mm-hmm. get one mm-hmm. and start running your business out of it. And then you can definitely see the people you need to see to make sure it's correct at first. But I don't. Agree. Don't take too much time to set it up because you want to get up and running quickly. Right. And you want this process to take less than a day. Sure. 100%. And, and going into that too, like, you know, people get kind of hung up on starting an LLC and like the next thing they do is like, I should get business cards, you know, and then yeah. like, they spend 10 days making a business card. No, you need to be ironing the hell out need, of your systems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't get stuck. Here's what a lot of people get stuck with that mm-hmm. I've seen. You know, they'll spend their first couple of weeks on just figuring out a business name and mm-hmm. a logo. Yep. 
Love and figure word. out business cards. And they're like, well, I can't do anything else until I get this perfect. Mm-hmm. And you're absolutely wrong about that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Those are the back burner items. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just, they're things that you think are important, but they're, they're not that important. What, yeah. What's important is you getting clients and, and you doing the business. Yeah. Servicing those clients and figuring out the kinks as you go along. Yep. Yep. Because you're you're going to screw up. You're going to suck when you first start. Oh, yeah. And that's just, you got to be okay with that. And you've just got to keep making improvements as you go along. Mm-hmm. But the biggest mistake I see people do is that they do everything but actually go try to get business. Right. And that's, unfortunately, I say that way too much. Yes, I agree. And I will say, like, when we started Ginger Snap Media, like, I had no experience in real estate photography. We learned by you just finding somebody who wanted to try me out. Yeah. And you're like, here you go, asshole. Here's your first shoot. Figure it out. And I, it was the best learning experience I ever could have had. And it was the worst <laughs> service you've ever performed on somebody's uh, yeah, <laughs> house. And, and that's to be expected. Mm-hmm. So that's why maybe sometimes you got to do your first few services for free mm-hmm. or for uh, at, at cost or just yeah. let them know, hey, this is my first time. I'm going to screw up. Please give me feedback. Let's go. Yeah. Another thing, you got your business. Mm-hmm. You got your EIN number. Mm-hmm which you can get on the IRS website like that Mm -hmm. instantly. You don't have to wait for it. The next thing that you're going to want to get is a business check-in account through your bank that you're banking with. Mm -hmm. So once you have those three things, then you can do transactions. Mm -hmm. I'd recommend your bookkeeping. Use like QuickBooks or something like that right away Mm -hmm. or Mint, something free maybe. That's good, yep. But start categorizing your transactions right from the get-go right away. Yeah. If you have a small business, just a self-employed business, I would definitely recommend QuickBooks Self-Employed. I know you run the big boy QuickBooks because you have a lot of transactions. I was actually scaling that down this morning. Yeah. I noticed that I'm spending like 280 bucks a month when I don't need to. I only need the $90 a month plan. There you go. Yeah, my uh, and my that two hundred two hundred eighty dollar a month for some reason my book the bookkeeper is charging me two eighty eight and it's it's only two hundred dollars if I get it myself, <laughs> but <Right. laughs> anyway now I'm the bookkeeper yep. and trying to get things straight and you can make adjustments as you go along but at least I you know it took me a long time to actually start using QuickBooks once I started using it I'm like oh this makes sense I get it yeah yeah should have started right from the start because every time I did was getting ready for my tax year I would take several weeks Mm -hmm. laying on the floor with thousands of receipts all over the place trying to categorize things Mm -hmm. and if i missed a few receipts along the year which i'm sure i did then i'm missing tax write-off opportunities sure yeah and going to that too like when when i started the ginger snap this year i had no idea how complex my taxes would be or my spendings would be right Uh but within a week of starting it i'm like no 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 i need to be tracking my transactions 100%, right? And I want yes. to track how many miles I'm doing because QuickBooks and self-employed will do that for you. I want to track all my receipts. I want to track all my dinners. I want to track like everything. Yes. That would be the worst part of my life if I had to do that myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So something that I've that I've learned that took me 13 years to learn is like receipt tracking. Yep. QuickBooks has th- this awesome feature called like Snap and you just you snap your receipts as soon as you get them into the system, and mm-hmm. then you can just throw it away. Yep. But for the longest time, I would save receipts, go back over them, try to find them. And if you could just immediately get it in your system, mm-hmm. half the time when I'm at a store, when the receipt comes out of the computer, I'm standing there still, and I'm pulling up my app, or I have it already ready to go, and I snap the receipt yep. right there, right then and there. And I might write on it real quick, too, what it's for yep. on the top. That way I can see my notes later. I always carry a pin on me. Yep. That's kind of important if you're a business owner. I, li- <laughs> I like to have a pin always in my pocket. Mm-hmm. Um, I just write my notes on my phone, but you can do it however you want. Yeah, that's me. Yep. But <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm getting I'm finding that using these AI tools is beca- is making my business life so much easier. And if I if I would have just taken advantage of what was there years ago, right? I mean, how many good God hours would I have saved? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's nuts. And like. If you if you're a receipt saver too, we'll just touch on this real quick. But like I've, I've saved receipts before, so you save them in a little filing cabinet or whatever. Sometimes you pull out the receipts at the end of the year and they're faded because they, you haven't <laughs> touched them in a while. And you can't yeah. even see what the expense is for. It just looks like a blank piece of paper now. Well, the biggest problem you have is like you think you know immediately. Yeah, I got this receipt. I'll put it away. You, you know that day what you spent your money on. Right. You know, eleven months down the road, mm-hmm. if you're anything like me, you got all these receipts. And you just kind of have to guess what they were for. You're like. Damn it. I don't write. <laughs> um, and you're missing half of them. Yeah. <laughs> but it, receipt tracking doesn't have to be complicated. No. Use 2023's 
apps mm -hmm. and the technology that's out there to, to stay more organized. Just it's a habit, I think, when it comes to business, the admin side of your business, a lot of people struggle with paperwork and trying to keep things clean. But it's really just a habit. It's not necessarily that person. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you can build habits right away to stay organized, mm -hmm. man, it's gonna just allow you to have a clear mind to do the business and service your clients the best you can. Sure. And if you're anything, if you are starting a service-based business, Nick kind of touches on this at the beginning of the episode too, your client relationship management. Is that right? CRM? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. CRMs. Yeah. If you don't have a CRM, do yourself a favor and get one. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have a database, you don't have a business. Right. And, and <clears> what a CRM does, it lets you know like who you've had contact with who you've done business with. And it allows you to see this in a nice spreadsheet type of way where you can say, oh, I haven't talked to Jimmy in four months. Maybe I should reach out to him and see if he needs anything, right? And you yeah. can just you can just re -key up, keep uploading this. And as long as you keep up to date on your CRM, like you shouldn't have any problem with client relations or client acquisition. <laughs> well, it's the most, like it's one of those fundamental business practices that you mm. just got to do. Right. Like think of a, like the dentists and your doctors, mm -hmm. they have CRMs because they if they didn't, it would be absolute chaos. Right. <laughs> and that's the way most businesses are. They're mm -hmm. absolute chaos. That's why 80% of them suck and they go bankrupt or they just go out of businesses because people just can't keep their stuff organized. Mm -hmm. But just know this, you may, you know, maybe you're starting a landscaping business and you're just running out the doors and you can keep everything in your head. Like, yeah, I know Sammy, I know this person and mm -hmm. I don't need to keep notes on some system. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But guess what? 10 years from now, maybe like for instance, with my business, mm -hmm. I started off with, yeah, just a couple of people. Right. And I could have kept it in my head, but for how long? I have 4,800 people now in my database. <laughs> I can't keep all those people. <laughs> I can't keep all those people in my head. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing what happens when I get a call. Mm -hmm. I can do a quick search as I'm on the call with somebody who claims that, you know, we spoke four years ago or something like that. Or mm -hmm. I, obviously what I like to do is always save people's name in my phone. But mm -hmm. I'll, let's say I'll get this call from one of the 47 Daves I have in my phone. <laughs> and I don't remember this guy named Dave Miller. Mm -hmm. As I'm um, answering, hey, Dave, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Oh, Nick. You know, I just say his name because that's the name that's on the phone. Right. And you immediately have that relationship kind of reestablished almost. Yep. And if I'm at my database, I can quickly pull up Dave Miller and see my notes. Oh, yeah, we, we worked together four years ago or at least had a few calls. Maybe I showed him a house or two. Forgot all about this guy. But now it's all coming back to me immediately because I could, took good notes. Right. That's right. This guy was having a baby. And, you know, Dave can be like, yeah, so we're, we're thinking about buying again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's it? Man, I haven't talked to you in like four years. And then Dave is going to be impressed. Yeah. How do you remember me? Wow. Four years ago, you remember that? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. You're having, you know, did everything go okay with your kid growing up? You know, <laughs> yeah, whatever notes they tell you, just put it in how's your How's your phone? daughter? <laughs> it, is she in kindergarten yet? Right. It's a good it's not just a good practice. It's like the ultimate practice for right. a successful business. Right. I like to even put my clients' birthdays in my CRM and just Eat. wish them a, just a nice, quick, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do this one of two ways. I either text them and just say, hey, happy birthday, man. Hope everything's good. Let me know if you need anything, right? Yeah. Uh, or I'll send them just a, a video message real quick on my cell phone because that's highly personal too. And that's a really good way to have client retention, make things personal. Like Nick was saying, you know, use his yeah. name, remember the facts about him. Yeah. Uh, remember when you talk to him, but just a video message like, of my face saying like hey man how's it going happy birthday just want to say hi um hope you're doing well like and send that yep and that guy's gonna remember for the rest of his life that i send him a video message on his birthday right yeah <laughs> and with that example dave i may have been sending dave properties for the last four or five years mm -hmm. automatically because i put them in a system you, with some sort of a crm you want to set it and forget it yep or like in the real estate sales business you can get people set up on a you know a custom tailored search for particular property mm -hmm. and if you screw up and never call them back there's still a chance they may call you back four years later yeah happened happened to me plenty of times when i had no right to earn their business again because i never reached back out to them sure but i have these systems in place where it seems like to dave i keep sending i'm making an effort out there and right. i keep sending them properties and dave is so impressed that like all these years go by of him to his and he's needs. still sending me properties and then I call him and he remembers my name. Holy crap, I need to work with this guy. Yeah. 
And whole, it, I'm not just making this stuff up. This stuff has happened to me multiple times right. in the past. And because I've scaled my business, I'm able to easily do a warm transfer to somebody on my team for right. Dave to work with. Yeah. Yeah, Dave, we'd love to help you out. And I always say, we. We. I don't right. ever say, I want to help you out or I'm going to meet with you. Mm-hmm. We would love to help you out. Thanks for calling me back. That, Appreciate that's good that. Info for sure. Like, let me check in. To, let me check into something, or or myself, or my, or someone on my team is going to call you right back and see if we can show you that property. Yeah. And then I send send the notes to somebody else on my team. Let's say it's Caitlin. Mm-hmm. Okay, Caitlin, I'm putting this contact in your name. Mm-hmm. Here's the notes. You just call me back. I haven't talked to him in four years. Sounds sounds like he's doing great. He's ready to buy. Would you go ahead and call him? Yeah. There's no need for me to call back Dave because I told him. Either I'm, me or somebody on my team is going to call you back and see if that property is still available to show it to you. Mm-hmm. I like how you said that, Why, by the way, the we, like we will get in touch with you. Yep. Uh, it's like my business, different thing. Like I'm the guy, so I'm going to be the one making the call. And For now. For now, right. Yeah. Uh, but you, you've already built your business enough where like people know you have agents and just because they don't work with you directly, they're still benefiting from you by working with someone on their team. Yeah. Dave doesn't need me to physically come to right. a property to show him. <laughs> But Dave has been getting properties from me and my little logo mm-hmm. for the last four years, and he's impressed yeah. that he called me and I said, hi, Dave. Right. And Be sometimes personal. that's all it takes. <laughs> Instead of hello, you never, if you're in business, don't ever answer your phone and say hello. Yeah. <laughs> I think when I do that in people, I'm like, I already don't want to do business with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're in business, answer the phone with, hello, this is Nick, mm-hmm. or hello, this is Dave, or hello, this is Jeremy. Mm-hmm. How can I help you? And save everybody you ever talk to, try to save their number. Right. Whether there's somebody within the business, you know, like I save every other agent's number I talk to. I just, I load my phone up with contacts and save names Mm -hmm. and emails as much as I can because it's, if you, if you're just, if you make it a habit, Mm -hmm. that habit will either serve you or it won't serve you. Right. The habit of saving names serves me. Mm-hmm. The habit of that a lot of people have of not saving names, not keeping a database, that yeah. habit will definitely not serve them well. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to kind of get into on this episode, Nick? Um, yeah, real quick. Write this down. This is something that took me a while to learn. But with all business, mm-hmm. uh, it's all about client acquisition and retention. Mm-hmm. And you're, if you're in a service-based business... So keep that in mind. That's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Half your day should be spent on trying to get new customers. Mm-hmm. The other half should be servicing those. Right. So what I like to do and encourage agents on my team is to spend the morning in the office getting updated with your, you know, learn the inventory, see what's came on the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm talking about being a real estate agent now, but sure. this, this can go into many different segments of mm-hmm. different industries. But you come in in the morning after you've done exercises or whatever, you're ready for the day and you, you get caught up real quick on the market, get caught up on your emails if you have, if you have to. Mm-hmm. And then you spend the next couple of hours setting appointments for that week. And then you save your afternoons to go on appointments. Yeah. That took me a long time, <laughs> surprisingly, <laughs> to learn how to coordinate my calendar. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have that structure your day can really become reactionary. And right. by default, you're just reacting to everything that comes by you. And that's where you're going to have a roller coaster in your business where you're doing great and then you're doing lows and mm-hmm. you're doing great and lows. And it happens to a lot of real estate agents out there and lenders and other business owners because they will just be reactionary to whatever's coming at them and they will put all their focus on getting that stuff done. They won't set a time in the morning to try to get new business because mm-hmm. they're working on that thing. And instead of just devoting half the day to servicing and half the day to getting staying organized and bringing in new clients. Sure. I think that's really and good. scheduling, mm-hmm. getting appointments. With service-based business, it's all about appointments. So, right. got to con- constantly feed your calendar mm-hmm. with appointments, make that a focus, and then you got to have those open spots, maybe two open spots a day. Mm-hmm. Like as a real estate agent, you'd be surprised how little appointments you need to go on in a week to make six figures. Sure. It could just be as little as like one or two quality appointments a week. Right. And how do you get those appointments? You call clients. And how do you call clients? You get a database. How do you yeah. get a database? Yeah. You got to work backwards. And it's, you reverse engineer it. Yep. Just reverse engineer the whole thing. And then you, you figure out where you want to go and just like literally work backwards from that. 
like right now, and I know we're running kind of short on time, but I do a lot of social media outreach. Yeah. So I just go on Instagram. I find realtors in the area and I start a conversation with them. Yeah. I, I literally message them and I'm just like, hey, that's a really awesome thing. And I don't even try to pitch my services. Yep. So that's called lead generation. Yep. Yep. I, I just, so you're trying to get an engaged lead. Yep. Trying to get an engaged lead. I'm not even trying to pitch my service. I'm just trying to like, hey, that's a really cool listing you have. How much is it? And it's like get conversations going, right? So then they start talking with me. Yeah, I say like, oh, by the way, like I do real estate photography. So on your next listing, uh, let me know if you need help. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to work with you. Yeah, and if you're confused on how much time should you focus on lead generation versus mm-hmm. other activities or follow up, what I think works really well when you're first starting, you should probably put eighty percent of your efforts into, or eighty percent of your time. Let's say you're blocking off half your day, mm-hmm. half your day for this, half the day for appointments. Right. Spend 80% of your efforts trying to get new clients, yep. making new contacts. Call 10 to 20 people a day, have t- 10 to 20 conversations a day. Mm-hmm. Let them know what you do and ask them for referrals instead of maybe a business, maybe instead of business directly from them. Yeah. So let's say you're in landscaping, you call people, call all your friends, acquaintances, mm-hmm. acquaintances and tell them that, hey, you started a landscaping business this year. Uh, you have a lot of great goals. Hope everything's going well. Just curious, do you have anybody that maybe you can refer to me that yeah. might need landscaping? Yeah. And you just stop and let them think about it. You don't interrupt. Mm-hmm. And they may give you a name or two. And surprisingly, sometimes they may right. <laughs> need well, landscaping, yeah, yeah. but you don't have to directly ask them. Mm-hmm. You're asking if you, if they have anybody for you. I think that's and a then, really good point. And then you make those notes in your CRM and you mm-hmm. move on. And then the next week, you do follow-ups mm-hmm. and then you can call that person again and say, Hey, thank you so much for referring that, you know, a couple of people to me. John actually took me up on it. I yeah. appreciate that. Okay, do I have your mailing address right? I want to just send you a quick coffee card. Yeah. You know, and, and then, Oh, by the way, you don't ever need Lancers landscaping services. Do you? Right. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate cool. it. Yeah. I'm going to send you this card. Yeah. Move on to the next. <laughs> but what you've done is you've done two things. Mm-hmm. The first week you'd, generated leads Mm -hmm. the second week you're doing follow-ups and there Mm -hmm. there's a difference and over time once you build a pretty good sized database you can focus more heavily on follow-ups like 80 percent sure and then have some sort of lead generation 20 percent of your time Mm -hmm. is going all the time because you're going to have plenty of people in your database that you will start marketing to that already know you and you're working on the like and trust right 100 percent. one thing to get comfortable hearing no yeah. And and it's just expect it. Expect it, right? Because it's going to happen and it's going to happen more often than you think. The sooner you can get to no or get to yes, like that means you don't have to mess with them and you can obviously keep reiterating the funnel. But if you get a direct no like no, I'm not interested in your services. Cool, man. Cool. You check it off. Yep. Cuz over time you're going to learn how many no's does it take to get a yes. Exactly. You know, if you're like, "Oh, it takes six no's." Mm-hmm. Cool. I'm going to tally up. I want three appointments, so I'm going to have to call 18 people. Yep. That way I can get through my no's. And tally my nose, I'm making a tally as I'm making my calls. No, no, no. Perfect. We're out of, you know, I should be getting a, and then you're at maybe three appointments if your conversion ratios are right. roughly that. And you'll then, figure it out over time. You'll figure out how to reverse engineer how much effort you need to mm-hmm. put into lead generation to fill your calendar. Mm-hmm. And I particularly love working with serious clients who just get crap done. Mm-hmm. Like I work with wishy-washy people who are like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe not. I'm like, the, I'm going to schedule appointments whether or not you do it that day, by the way. Like, it's a no until it's a yes for me. So I'm not going to put <laughs> you on my schedule as a maybe and block off time for you if you're not serious about taking my time. So, and that's just my maybe particular to real estate sales or photography. But uh, the sooner yep. I can get somebody on my schedule as a yes, the better. Right on. Yep. All right. So let's wrap this up. Let's do it. Um, we gave a lot of insight and what we do to build Mm -hmm. our businesses if you guys want to get involved and engaged on these we would love that feel free to comment or message us let us know what other topics you might want to hear on somebody on youtube asked us to do a market video and we did that Mm -hmm. um thank you so thank you for that if you want to hear more from us just you know youtube's probably the easiest way we can see comments i think yeah unless you got another source youtube's great um i think it's got our email on there as well but um even comments on the videos are well appreciated because they do show that the video is getting traction and show that people are watching so we do like that as well again if you do enjoy the episodes please give us a five-star review don't leave us a four-star review i hate those and he'll bite your spouse i'll bite your (laughs) You're in there. I'm not going to go out of my way to bite your spouse, but if you know, I see him at the grocery store or something, <laughs> I'll buy him a plane ticket. 
We yep, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this spouse. No, no, no. The spouse but, um, anything else you want to add? So obviously, you know, make sure you comment, make sure you like. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please do so. Um, I really enjoy doing this. Yeah, this I, is great, I like uh, I like being in person instead of the the Zoom calls, which I'm sure we'll get back in the habit of some of that. I'm here sure and there. we will too. Hey, does anybody notice the difference in quality of the video? Well, Jeremy brought his camera over today. I did. Let us know if you can notice a difference. This is the sp- same camera that we bought for Ginger Snap Media. Oh dang! So was it Canon? That's a Canon. I thought we brought bought a Sony. I guess we bought a Canon too. We got both. I bought the lens. You bought the camera, buddy. No big deal. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's take this thing home, man. So uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. Thanks to my lovely co-host Nick for always having the the best real estate investing podcast around. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We'll see you next time. We've got some great guests lined up. Sarah Barb's coming back. Yeah. And Kyra Bemis is coming back. I love it. So stay tuned. I love it. All right. See you guys. Thank you so much for checking out the Investor Shed podcast. If you enjoyed your time, make sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow along on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at The Investor Shed for shorts and promos about each episode. Do you want to be a guest or know someone who has great real estate investing advice and stories? Reach out to us at theinvestorshed at gmail.com.